Well, I thought uh, before we read the, read the word, I thought it would probably be helpful for me to go ahead and just kind of acknowledge the elephant in the room. I am very aware that Alabama beat A&M last night. I just don't want y'all to feel awkward on your way out, whether you could look at me or say anything about it. It's all right. I mean, it's, it's okay. Just Interestingly enough, though, that the Lord has put it on my heart today to preach about humility. <laughs> One of the best books that I read over the summer was a book written by Bob Goff. The name of the book is Love Does. I want you to listen to one of the things that Bob wrote in his book. He says, something happens when you feel ownership. You no longer act like a spectator or consumer because you're an owner. Faith is at its best when it's that way too. It's best lived when it's owned. If you were unable to be with us last week, we began this eight-week series entitled, This Is My FPC. Really, those words of Bob Goff really summarize what the vision has been for this series. It's that idea that all of us in this room, maybe we say in, in different ways, but we say, you know what, this is my church, this is my FPC. But what we're going to look at over the course of the eight weeks is we're going to look at what does it mean for us to take ownership in the life of this church? What does it mean for us to take ownership of our faith in order to be a part of Christ's redemptive work in this city and in this world? But let me also say this, because many of you um, want to let me know how I'm doing. (laughs) And so we... We had this idea of this is my FPC. But let me just make something very clear so that you know this. There is no doubt in my mind that this is Christ's church. So don't ever mistake that I think that it's not. This is Christ's church. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, you and I have a responsibility to respond to what God has done in our lives just simply because he loved us. And we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to take ownership of what has been given to us and to be able to use that and show that as part of the redemptive work in this city and in this world. So I know whose church it is. But what I would say is that maybe we all should remember that. So let's look at the word together. I invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. I will begin reading in verse 1. I invite you now to listen. You see, the thing is, it's just so hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, right? I mean, who isn't singing that right now? But why don't we just get a glimpse into somebody who absolutely was perfect in every way? And yet was still humble. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2 in Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantages. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth and under the, and under the earth and every tongue 
acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, I believe with all of my heart that this is the word of God. And I believe that God always blesses the reading and the hearing of his word. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, whatever it is that we might have brought in here this morning that was too much of us and not enough of you, Lord, would you just, would you just humble us today? Lord, would you, just, would you just soften our hearts a little more today that, that they may be shaped by your spirit? Or God, would you remind us again of just this, this picture of your son Jesus that literally had it all, but literally chose to give it all. So Lord, we just, we ask that you meet us where we are. In the name of Christ, amen. Service above self. If any of you are are members of Rotary, then you've probably heard that motto, service above self. What's interesting to me about that motto is I did a little work on kind of how that came about. The members of the first Rotary Club, what they realized was that fellowship and mutual interest were not enough to keep a group of busy professionals meeting weekly. Did you hear that? Fellowship and mutual interest were not enough to keep the group together. And so they began to think about it and undertaking efforts to to improve lives of others, they began to realize that's really more important. That's really what's going to hold us together. That's really what's going to give us excitement. And by 1910, they had formed 16 rotary clubs in the United States. The first convention they had together was held in Chicago. And at that convention in Chicago, there was one of those early members in Rotary. And he had an idea. He said, you know what? We just got to kind of somehow or another articulate what it is that we're really about. And so he proposed this motto. He profits most who serves his fellows best. Well, the following year, they all gathered together again, and there was another one of the, the, the leaders in Rotary that had kind of been one of the first leaders, and, and he began to really think about what this was all about, and he promoted the idea that the club should be organized on the principle of service, not self. And so now they got two. Well, in 1989, what they did was they put together this Rotary International Council of Legislation, and they got together, and they, and they made an official decision. They said, you know what? Here's what it's going to be, service above self. And that became their motto. If you ever go to a Rotarian meeting, if you ever go to downtown Rotary, which if I'm a member of that, then you will know something about this idea of service above self. But I began to think about the history of the Rotarians. And I also began to think about the reality that First Presbyterian Church also experiences a rich history. We too are a people that have a history that many, many folks know something about. But like those Rotarians... Fellowship and mutual interest are not enough to keep us thriving for the kingdom of God as we continue to make history. It can't simply be about just coming and sitting here together. It can't simply be for us to say, hey, well, yeah, I mean, I kind of like, okay, yeah, well, I kind of. Fellowship and mutual interest are not enough. Foundational to our history and paramount to our future is this idea that we have got to understand the concept of service above self. But at the same time, we have to realize that it's also going to have to embody a response from us. And I think that's why Paul was writing to the church in Philippi. I think Paul realized that the church needed to understand this idea of service above self. Paul made this appeal to the people that that their unity and that their love for one another, that it would be based 
on their shared comfort and their shared love, that comfort and that love that came from the amazing grace of Jesus Christ and the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying that's what your foundation is. That's what's going to sustain you. That's what's going to propel you. That's what's going to compel you. Paul was talking to the church in Philippi. He urged them to complete his joy. He said, complete my joy by continuing to deliver the gospel message. Ah, man, my joy is usually complete when my Aggies win. My joy is usually complete when when I got a little more in the bank account. My joy is usually complete when people are nice to me. My joy, right? And Paul says, no, 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 look. Make my joy complete by being a deliverer of the gospel message. Imagine if that was all that we had to do. Was deliver to deliver the gospel message. And so what Paul is saying to the church, he says, look, this is what, this is what you have to do. And he goes, but in order for you to do that, you got to get your act together. In order for you to do that, the murmuring and the arguing amongst yourselves has got to cease. The way you're treating each other in the church, that's got to cease because they're not going to buy the message because it doesn't really appear to be good news to you. He says you got to get your act together. you got to come to a common mind about life together in Christ and you got to show that same mutual love for others. But I'm going to talk, I just want to stop for just a second because I want to just ask you a couple of questions. Do you have any encouragement from being united with Christ? Do you, do you have any comfort from his unconditional love for you? Do you have any fellowship with the Spirit? Have you ever been saved by God's amazing grace in Jesus Christ? Really? I mean, have you been saved by his grace? I mean, have you really allowed the gospel message to set you free? Or have you just been coming to the church for a while? Now, if you answered no to any of those questions, then I want you to hear this. I would love to meet with you one-on-one because I would love the opportunity to remind you of how much God loves you and to remind you that God's grace is absolutely available to you right now today and that his grace still has the power to transform your life. But if you answered yes to all those questions, and as I'm looking out on you, I see heads nodding. If you answered yes to those questions, then let me ask you another question. So what? What difference is it making in your life? Because you see, the very foundation of FPC is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. When we were sinners, see, 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 we were sinners before we were members. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. We were sinners before he redeemed us. We were lost before he found us. We were dead before he ushered us into life abundantly. Jesus did not view his, his, his divine being and his rank as something that he could just strut around. He he didn't just think it was something that he needed to have and nobody else got. He couldn't because it would be very inconsistent with his character, but instead the word tells us that he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He became obedient. He became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And why did he do it? He did it for you. Thank the Lord he did it for me. 
He did it because he understood the concept of service above self. And at least in my opinion, that should bring us to our knees in humility, in gratitude, in response. That should be what stirs us every day to go out into the world and, and, and make Jesus known. I mean, look at what verse 4 says. It says, do, not do, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. What's so interesting about the Greek is this word for interest. It's like this filler word. It's like this open-ended word. Uh, this, this is how John Piper described it. He said this. He said, so it could be that each of you look not only to your own financial affairs or your own property or your own family or your own health or your own reputation or your own education or your own success or your own happiness. Don't just think about that. Don't just have desires about that. Don't just strategize about that. Don't just work toward that. But look to the financial affairs and property and family and health and reputation and education and success and happiness of others. He said, in other words, make the good of others the focus of your interest and your strategy and your work and your life. Find your joy in making others joyful. Nah. It's more fun to kind of stir them up. It's more fun to kind of hover over them and tell them what they're not doing right. Because that makes us look good. Humility leads to response. Humility is the prerequisite for having the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Humility is the opposite of entitlement. Humility is the opposite of you owe me. Humility is glad that God gets all the credit, both in private and in public. Humility happily admits that everything we have is a free gift from God so that we can't boast. Humility gives away to others rather than storing up for oneself, humility looks for opportunity rather than being shut down by difficulty. Humility is being realistic about who we are and whose we are. Quite simply, humility is the result of being overwhelmed by God's grace in Jesus Christ. And so as you sit here this morning, are you overwhelmed? By God's grace? Or are you simply overwhelmed and tired because you've been trying to get it all right yourself? If I can just make a little more, if I can just throw another jab at that person, if I can just look a little better, if I can just make a better grade, if I can just impress a few more people, that's tiring. But when we become overwhelmed by God's grace, we begin to realize that we don't have to get it right because he did. And together, together, we can say this is my FPC because the future of FPC, it survives and it thrives on this attitude of service above self. And if we are not overwhelmed by God's grace, then we will be underwhelmed in our response. We will think of reasons to not give to First Presbyterian Church if we are not overwhelmed by his grace. We will think about reasons not to serve at First Presbyterian Church if we are not overwhelmed by God's grace. We will think of reasons to be ugly to people in this church if we are not overwhelmed by God's grace. We will think of reasons to think more highly of ourselves if we are not overwhelmed by God's grace. C.S. Lewis in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity, he made this brilliant observation. Interestingly enough, it was at the end of his chapter on pride. But he said, 
If we were to meet a truly humble person, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying that or that they are a nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. He said the thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel-humbled person is how much they seemed to be totally interested in us. Will you be Will you be a gospel humbled person in your FPC? If you were with us last week, then you heard a little something about what we're trying to do as we think about this as my FPC. You got to see a video last week and really hearing the words of Matt McCaleb and talking about how, how this really was a church that really uh, just came alongside of him as he thought about um, doing mission. And so what we thought would be great is if we could just ask our mission partners. Many of you know that First Presbyterian Church has made a commitment to give 25% of our annual budget to benevolences. But let me let you in on a little secret. If, if we don't have any cash flow, right? I mean, we can't give 25% away of nothing, right? But what we said was, you know what? We need to be thinking about service above self. You know what? We need to be blessings in this community. And so, so we have various mission partners, local and global. And so we asked all of our mission partners, would you just write something that gives us a picture of why this is your FPC? One of those partners wrote back, several of them wrote back, but the one I'm going to share with you today came from our partner Mission Road Ministries. And the story really involves a young man named Jeremiah and another man named Eddie. Jeremiah is a 15-year-old African-American young man who came to live at Mission Road. When he came there to live, he is profoundly intellectually and developmentally disabled. He had never been taught basic life skills because his mother was an alcoholic and treated him abusively. In place of love, he was beaten and burned. In place of care, he was left in bed to wallow in his soiled clothes and sheets. He could not hold himself upright in his wheelchair. He had few clothes. He had matted and unruly hair. He didn't want anyone to touch him. He didn't want anyone to come around him. He didn't want anyone to be in his space. And needless to say, he trusted no one. Enter into the picture, Eddie, a strong and gentle African-American man who is on staff at Mission Road. Eddie is a humble servant and a remarkable caregiver who made Jeremiah his priority. When Jeremiah could not sit still for a barber, Eddie took time after work hours to painstakingly cut his hair. He carefully dressed Jeremiah in new clothes. He even bought some things for Jeremiah with his own money. Eddie loved and respected Jeremiah, and he gave of himself to Jeremiah. Eddie understood service above self. At Mission Road, new hope began to come alive in Jeremiah. He's he's loved, and he knows it. He knows something about the visible reality of God's grace in his life. Jeremiah is healing. He's healing in in body and in mind and in spirit. He's learning to take responsibility for his actions and to make good choices uh, about his behavior. He's letting people into his life. He's letting people come alongside of him. He's letting people touch him. He's beginning to trust. Jeremiah is gaining independence and self-respect because somebody... Put service above self and delivered the gospel message to Jeremiah. You see, there's something that happens when you feel ownership. You no longer act like a spectator or a consumer because you're an owner. And you see, this is my FPC. This is my FPC, is what you say. Well, hear me when I say this. 
We do not live or give in response to a denomination. We do not live or give in response to a gray-haired preacher. We do not live or give in response to a building. We don't live or give in response to some perceived status that comes with being a member of your FPC. We do not live or give in response to whether or not we like a hymn or not. We live and give solely in humble response to God's grace in Jesus Christ. We give because of what he has given to us. And when we give, we have a chance to make the gospel message known to people like Jeremiah, to people like Eddie, to ministries like Mission Road. But it's going to take humility. Because when we humble ourselves, it's hard to humble ourselves. But it's so comforting to know that when we do, we get him. You see, that's what love did. And that's what love still does. I think I'm done. Amen.